Um, I'd like to um, introduce my panel here. On my far right is um, Matthew Putman, who's the CEO of Nantronics. Is that correct? That's a yep, Nanotronics. Yes. Nanotronics, sorry. Yeah. Nano meaning very, very small. Uh, Nanotronics. Um, now, this is a company that specializes in some very intriguing imaging systems, I believe, um, from what I can see, and we'll come more to that. Uh, then we have um, Sharon Burrow here, um, who is the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, which employs, I saw on some website, 100, well, you employ, you represent some 180 million workers worldwide, is it? And many of those, I guess, are going to be in the electronics industry. Absolutely. Indeed. And then we have somebody who makes kit, and makes a lot of interesting kit. And uh, um, this is uh, Chen, who likes to be known as Randy Regu. Reg Reg and he is the Senior Vice President of BOE Technology Group. Um, they do a lot of things, um, including a supplier of Internet of Things. Um, so what I'm going to do now, first of all, is, is, is ask my panel members to uh, briefly introduce themselves and, and tell us a little, little bit about their company or their organization uh, so we know what they're doing and a bit more. And then we'll open this up to uh, a general conversation and hopefully we'll have a bit of time for some uh, question and answers. So uh, if I can come, with you, come to you, Matthew, first of all. Can, tell us about your company and, and yourself. Oh, sure. Uh, so Nanotronics, as you mentioned, makes inspection equipment uh, for a lot of the electronics industry, from semiconductors to flexible electronics and screens, sort of the entire supply chain. Um, so we do both imaging, and I think maybe even more important than taking images of things is how though we use computational solutions to analyze what we're imaging. Okay. So we use sort of the latest in artificial intelligence and in you know, co computational manipulation of images. Uh, for inspection purposes, for process control, and sort of shortening the time between research and production to help improve yields and uh, develop new products. Okay, so this is what I might, you might want to call robot vision. So it's not just looking at something, but interpreting what it is. Exactly. Okay, exactly. and you're doing that at very small scale as well. Yeah, so small scale, we can see small things. Yeah. Well, over large areas, or we yeah. can look at very large areas and interpret. And by small things, I mean biological things as well. Can't you get down? Can yes, you get yeah. yes. Uh, that's, that, that's quite remarkable. Okay. Um, uh, Sharon, can you tell us then about yourselves and your organisation? Well, we represent the global labour movement. I'm the General Secretary of the ITUC, and in every country there's a confederation of labour. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, they are our members. So... My role basically is to represent workers across a broad range of areas. And in the in the terms of this particular focus, then at the moment I co-chair the future of production for the uh, World Economic Forum with trade and industry ministers and with uh, business leaders and unions and civil society with the president of Carnegie Mellon, Supra okay. Suresh. And indeed uh, the G20 has this firmly on their agenda, particularly with a focus on digitalisation as the kind of tram tracks of the future in terms of um, the connectivity between production processes and artificial intelligence. So it's taking up a big part of our work with a, with a kind of um, cautionary tale about, you know, we, we know that it'll have a big impact on jobs, on skills, but for unions, we're not frightened of the technology. We want to see, though, in whose interest it's being deployed and how we manage it. I walk the supply chains of many of the electronics companies, and I can tell you that it might be uh, Industry 4.0 in these discussions, but for working conditions and rights, it's often, you know, 0 0.4. Yeah. So we need to find that balance if we're to have a sustainable economic future. We indeed had some examples of that given to us yeah. uh, yesterday um, from, by a professor. Um, okay, now we'll, we'll move to Randy, who will speak in Chinese. You can find him uh, with an English translation on Channel 2, I'm told. Um, <laughs> Randy, over to you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, GMIS, and thank you, Paul. That's Before good. I come here, I... Are we getting any translation here? Yeah. I've already been with the United States, Matthew, and I've already been with a friend. Because everyone may be familiar with BOE, 
，这边情况可能不是很了解，那么我也想借借借此机会也介绍一下 BOE 吧。最近大家可能都听说很多中国制造的故事，那么 B O E 的成长故事可以说是一个非常典型的 Made in China story。我们公司是九三年成立，二零零三年我们开始做这个 T F D L C D 的产业。那么目前来讲，我们已经进入全球前三位。那么这可能这个具体的数字可能大家很难理解。那么大家可以想想，你们手上用的手机，全世界的手机，有四台来自于 B O E 的 panel。五台的电视，有一台来自 BOE。那么笔记本、Tablet， 四台来自 BOE。所以 BOE 因为以前都是做一个 B to B 的业务，所以大家可能还不是很了解。那么这个可以借此机会介绍一下 BOE。丢一是什么样的一个企业？谢谢 Paul。嗯。Well, that's an astonishing set of numbers from, <laughs> which which is which just shows the emergence of China as such yeah. a big manufacturer in、yeah. this business. But of course, we're getting、um, new technologies come along.、Um, uh, uh, Sharon said there, we, we this is an industry where wage costs are rising, and.、Um, Uh, uh, automation is increasing.、Um, we've already seen the first 3D printer on a cell phone production line in China,、uh, in Guangdong,、um, and it's printing the little aerial segments directly into the into the case of a, a, a cell phone. So we are seeing automation coming, which is presumably shortening and replacing many of these.、Um, Uh, production lines that operate not not just in China but in other parts of the world as well.、Um, I mean, what is the effect of automation in your business? Again, perhaps we start first with、um, yourself, Randy, and then then we'll come to the others. Okay. 好，这个讲到这自动化情情景，那么我们首首先要说一下，就自动化。给 BOE 带来些什么，或者是 BOE 要求就是自动化需要些什么要求？其实我们 BOE 的发展是跟工业自动化是完全紧密联系在一起的。嗯。Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Is our translation gone offline? Yes. Um, I'm just going to try. Hello, can you help us here? Hello, hello. Yeah. yeah they've sorted it out now. So two and five are the right channels. Two and five, five for English, is it? No, five for Chinese, two for English. Okay. It was okay. <laughs> okay, we're back now to where we originally were. Two for English, five for Chinese. Okay. Uh, no, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you carry on. I think it's back where it was. Okay, Randy, can you try again, please? Yeah. Okay. 那么工业自动化其实是跟 B O E 的成长是紧密的连在一起的。I think、um, should we try try a bit in English, shall we? Okay. Yeah. We're、okay. gonna Randy and I are gonna try this in English. My Chinese is terrible, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> so let me try it. Yeah. Before、uh, answer the question, yeah, automatic and the BOE automation, yeah, it's it close. It's very close. Very, yeah, very close. For example, we need a very high end 
product, machine, and equipment. So it's very expensive production equipment, yeah. and it's very yeah. high-end stuff. Yeah. Yeah. As you know, our product is the semiconductor display device. Yeah. So we need a lot of the high-end equipment. Mm. The second is we need a lot of automatic line production for the product. Yeah, automatic yeah. lines for the production of the yeah. product, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it's not easy and it's quite expensive. Yes. But it is coming. Yeah. And it does it makes a big difference to the number of people you employ. Yeah. The numbers on the production line. Yes. Yeah. And and the first we need a lot of flexible equipment for the manufacturing. Yeah. Yeah. Right now the business model for the beginning B to C. But right now more and more C to M. Yeah. What do you mean C to M? Customer to manufacturing. Okay. So that means we are must ask our manufacturing such as BOE must produce a lot of specific product. Yeah. To to meet the customer request. So the automotive machine and automotive production line is very important to BOE. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's going to be a big part of your future. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's in China. And would that be so overseas, in overseas factories as well? Uh, yes, we have a lot, a lot of research center mm. and sales office all over the world. OK. Yeah, for example, we have a subsidiary sales branch in Dubai. Mm -hmm. A lot of research center in America, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, even to Europe. Okay. Frank. Okay. I'll let you rest now. Yeah. I'll come to you and then I'll come to Sharon. Um, you, you produce goods. Now, do you make your own circuits, make your own products, or do you do what many companies do, which is subcontract that to, to companies like this? No, we, uh, we actually enable companies that make uh, circuits and other okay. things. We, are, we, are, we provide data analytics and we actually provide automation. Um, when you're talking about something like semiconductors, it's not only that there are cost efficiencies to having automation, but it's actually necessary. Uh, humans just cannot see things this small. Um, they, they don't have the ability to keep up with this rapid rise in the demands of consumers. Uh, so any advancement that is made in electronics that are expected, you know, when you get a, a new iPhone or you get a new consumer product, those expectations are there from the customer, but with, without the use of automation in inspection and you know, using things like artificial intelligence, humans just can't do it. Mm -hmm. So if we expect to get these as consumers, automation is just a requirement, but it also benefits us all in the yeah. end. It's, it's just a necessary part of what you're making. It's, it's necessary and, and extremely desirable, yeah. I think, in the end. Yeah. No, and not only to produce the things you're doing, to make those things function as well. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. What does this mean for jobs? Well, I think Randy was right, that we're in an era right now of competitive realities. The cost at the high end means that even if you have technology that might ultimately disrupt the pattern of supply chains and business today, it's not going to be with us tomorrow, except at small scale in many areas. And we talk about scenarios where the first scenario is that by 2030 you'll have uh, disruptive technology and economic activity will just take off and we'll have uh, everything will be con connected on a digital platform and the technologies you talk about are the things you referred to, digitalisation, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, robotry. Uh, so it's all there. Digital printing is another big one for disruptive manufacturing, of course. And they're all there. But you have to look at what the scenarios that might damage that future are. Mm. And I don't think you can deal without looking at uh, cyber tension and the ongoing risks of uh, cyber intrusion. You can't look at it without a damaged future where we continue to have slow global growth and uh, rising uh, nationalism or protectionism by an old world without the connectivity because people are frightened about their jobs. And indeed, you can't have it without thinking about the sustainability questions and what uh, people might choose by way of devolved futures, which now become increasingly uh, pos possible with not just energy transitions at the local level, but indeed uh, digital printing and so on. So for us, we say you have to be ready Mm -hmm. And it has to. You have to have a series of 
uh, capacities for adapting. But the jobs question, the experts will fight about it. What we do know for sure is that the last wave of technology hollowed out low skills. And indeed, it worked very well for us. Can I tell you, as uh, unions, we used to to integrate technology into businesses, bargain with employers, upskill and get higher wages. But this round will be different because you're now going to hollow out the middle skills and we'll see probably less of a, 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 um, a capacity to push everybody up unless we are, in fact, conscious of both skills and job opportunities. So we are worried about de-skilling a lot of jobs, particularly with automation. Mm. However, what we say is the fundamentals have to be there, a regulatory environment that gives people certainty, both business and, uh, indeed, consumers and, and labour and so on. But... The, if you take the digital environment, the fundamental rights of today are the fundamental rights of tomorrow. Mm-hmm. If you have social protection, including guaranteed income for periods of disruption, if you actually have a minimum wage so our kids are not uh, bidding against each other in a Darwinian way on a digital platform, if you have the right to uh, bargain collectively or freedom of association because we're already building freelance associations or uh, new unions of the future professional groupings who actually want changes in competition policy so they can bargain with the huge companies for the production base, whether it's producing for 3D printers or whether it's a traditional supply chain but with a digital base of contracting work. So I think we're in a hiatus. We have to set the foundations of what makes for decent work and then we'll manage like Mm -hmm. we have always. Society will make choices about technology, um, and I think there will be a lot of ethical issues. But from our perspective, it's about making sure that the demands for fundamental rights, decent wages, and indeed the dialogue with business and governments that make the future, the possibility of a future that's better for everybody, a reality. Okay. I, I like, should we come back on that? Matthew, first, would you like to come back on that? I mean, is that... Can you see that creating jobs and what you're producing as well as changing jobs or eliminating well, jobs? Well, what we've noticed from our partners, yeah. whether it's you know General Electric or 3M and these partners, is that the jobs that they are having in this future are actually a lot better. Um, factory line work, while something that seems you know, you know like guaranteeing wages, is not a future exactly that you know, we're seeing come to pass. We're seeing something where maybe you have a chance to interact with your machines in a way that is less dangerous, that has, uh, mm. that's more enjoyable. Yes, indeed. I mean, some and of the And so I actually yeah, think yeah. that there, with all of the worries about job loss, job, jobs being pleasant, <laughs> jobs being rewarding, and being a part of creating a, a better future, mm. we're actually seeing that. Yeah. I don't disagree with that, but are we going to see enough of them? In number term, That's yeah. the question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I was talking earlier about, uh, to a previous panel, about a, an Adidas factory that makes trainers opening in Germany this year. And it employs 200 people and uses um, automatic weaving and 3D printing to produce half a million trainers a year. There'd be a thousand people doing that in a, in another country. And 10 years ago, there would have been 2,000 there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it brings that. That's quite a transformational. But they do say, you know, it's high end. So, so numbers is going to be a big issue on this. Um, what about numbers, Randy? Please come in here. You employ big numbers of people. Um, is it going to change? And will those people? Um, will it change with technology? And I think I think interpretation is back up for us. So, okay. Uh, 感谢 Paul。刚才我听的两位的发言呢，我有一个比较比较实际的案例吧，就是发生在 B O E 的自身的情况。那个就业和自动化其实是有一个相互矛盾的的过程的。一方面，企业要自动化，提高工，提高生产效率，提高它的竞争力。那么这个必须得采用自动化，人工要减少。那么另外一方面呢，我们的人人要就业，要解决生存问题
。那以 B O E 的情况为例吧，我们现在很多的工厂采用了自动化的生产线。我们原来一个工厂大概是员工要有一千人，但是自动化以后呢，我们只要三百人就够了。那另外七百人的工人怎么办？我们就是进行了内部的再培训，一个工程师再造计划。我们建新的工厂，我们这这些工程师可以派到另外的新工厂去。我们在做我们的新的事业。那么这些雇员呢，又可以从事另外的行业，所以对 BOE 来讲是很很好的解决了这个工业自动化和员工就业这个问题。对我们来讲，我们这个过程是受到中国政府非常的赞誉的。又解决再就业，又工业自动化。Thank you. I understand that.、Um, and that all goes well while the markets are rising, doesn't it?、Um, but let me let me come up to a, another point now. Now, will those markets keep rising for electronics goods? We've all got gadgets. We love gadgets. There's all new things coming.、Um, Uh, the remarkability of the smartphone that we now have something in our pocket that would have put a, a man on the moon and or more than powerful than that even. So, what are the trends of the future in、um, the electronics industry? What you know, we have the Internet of Things. You're, you're involved in that. Just, you're involved in that as well, aren't you?、Yes. I mean, it, it's a, we have、um, uh, other types of. Products coming. We have automated cars, which are going to turn our cars into even bigger processing machines than ever.、Um, electronics has got a long, long way to play in this industry. So, what are the if you if you're interested in the electronics industry, what are the big trends to watch? Matthew, first of all, what what would you say? Well, you know, I'm a material scientist, and if you if 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 you look sort of in my lifetime, there have not been enormous breakthroughs. In material science,、mm -hmm. uh, even though we see Moore's law has enabled things, we're still using、like、silicon, aren't we? <laughs> yeah,、uh, and now we are actually seeing nanotechnology becoming、yep. real. We're seeing you know, graphene. We're seeing、uh, flexible electronics that are completely transparent. This allows for high energy devices. And it and ultimately at least leads to frictionless things. Better, you know, it leads to photovoltaics that work during the day and the night.、Um, I think that it's now not ready for an incremental change the way we've been seeing. I think that there needs to be hope, and we're actually now seeing the reality of very large changes. And those, to me, are a kind of industrial revolution that's not just about information、mm -hmm. passing, but it's sort of the equivalent of both. Moore's law starting the, and in other areas, and potentially looking back 120 years、mm -hmm. at infrastructure changes that you had with the Carnegie、uh, era. Yeah. So the combination of seeing steel and silica, silicon now we have with with brand new materials that lead to things like you were speaking about and we heard about earlier in transportation, telecommunications. And、yeah, many other areas. Well, we're, we're engineering at the nano level now, aren't we? We're、yeah. almost engineering from atoms up.、It's, and what we're going to do? The, well, you've seen the, the, what the labs are doing in, with material science at the moment. Right, There's and, some big and you, step changes. And you combine that with the additive nature of 3D printing、yeah. and putting it on an industrial scale.、Yeah. You have this customization of materials that are more powerful than anything before. This is something we never have seen before.、No. And so you, that and provides you, jobs and, and new technology. And you can probably embed the electronics in those products you're building. You could 3D print the circuits into them, 3D print the screens into them in the future. Absolutely, as well.、So、and that, it's being that done. That starts to change the supply chain as、yes. well, doesn't it?、Um, what do you think of that now? That future? Well, I think the disruption of the supply chain is the untold story. Yeah. If if you、mm -hmm. if you ignore the You know the potential for damaging this future with mistrust and so on. At some point, you've got now choices where the supply chain is is very short. 
And, uh, you know, when you're talking about putting a 3D printer in an automotive uh, uh, car factory, as opposed to having the components made in a million or a dozen different places, yeah. not knowing who your contractors are, then that's a future that will shift. And that's, you know, we worry about the, uh, the, the capacity for countries who've picked up the labour arbitrage, if you like, where the supply chain's been the long factory tail. And now you could see that within 20 to 30 years actually become very short. And what's the model of development then if we don't do two things? And one is if there's not a diffusion of technology. I was really encouraged by talking to uh, the Chinese uh, association just before this about the way they're building um, cooperative platforms with other industrial uh, chambers of commerce around the world. And if that allows for diffusion of technology, that'll do something towards having a, a development plan that works for everybody in a more localised environment. But I must say, I don't think... There are some companies who are there, but I talk to a lot of CEOs, and when I say, what's your game plan? I mean, even as simple as saying to, you know, uh, Levi's, what happens when you can walk down to the corner shop and actually say, I want a pair of black jeans with white stripes and I want four pockets and they're printed out while you wait? or you order them and you get them the next day, whatever the scenario is. I don't think any, any of us have thought through what that does to the current global model of business in a way that we can be confident about predicting the future. And the other piece is sustainability. I'm really heartened when I talk to young entrepreneurs. You know, I, I chaired a session at Davos and a lot of people our age were kind of talking about the future as if it was... Um, just tinkering with the current environment. Mm. And a young entrepreneur said, I don't understand you. Maybe it's a generational thing, but if you can't uh, reuse or recycle your materials, then don't deploy them in the first place. He said, we have to get to the point where our product is our resource. And so this is a very, very big challenge on the sustainability front. But it is becoming possible because of some of those breakthroughs. So I think... There's a lot more to think through than just, oh, we've got these new technologies mm. and they'll be all deployed tomorrow. I don't think that's going to be the case, but I think it will be, as I said, a real battle of competitive realities. Mm. The um, garment textile producers in the previous session here, uh, they, they, they don't yet have an automated no. sewing machine on the horizon. No. Uh, they are automating a lot of basic textile production, but actually sewing up garments, you still can't beat the deck of their workforce, which they said was very precious to them and it was part of their technology advantage. Now, we will see. Automation yeah, will come. I think we'll see. It will come. And they did say it is coming in areas, but there isn't full... You can't still yet press a button and push a piece of material in one end and get a pair of Levi jeans out the other. You might get the pocket stitch, you might get the corner stitch, but you mm. don't get the full automation. Mm. Randy, what about the big trends in the future? What do you see as big trends in electronics in the future? Mm. Uh, seem to switch channels yeah. again. This question is actually, just now, I'm going to answer the two of you's question. I'm going to take a deep breath. Yes, yes, yes. 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 更合适一点，因为任何一个小公司，它开始的时候一定是在某个细分市场是最厉害的。当他把这个细分市场做的很大的时候，他马上马上又变成个传统性的公司了，所以。这个是一个管理性的话题，如何是创业性的公司，那个传统的大公司之间的不断的持续的创新。那么对我们来讲，其实我们也碰到这个问题。刚才也介绍一下 B U E 了，我们在 Semiconductor Display 已经是全球第第二、第三的位置了。但是我们未来要做什么
我们对那些细分市场我们要做什么？其实我们的管理哲学就是这种：任何一个产品，十八个月也就一年半，一定是更新换代的，尤其是电子产品。那你看，打个比方 ，BOE 做的这显示产品，能源源不断的给我们工业自动化提供一些高精尖的显示产品。刚才讲的工业自动化帮助我们成长，那现在我们反过来帮助工业化不断的进步。其实，在电子行业，现在大家说的最多是 I O T 时代。那什么叫 I O T？ 就万物互联，显示无处不在。所以我们做显显示行业的，可以讲，以后我们所有建的什么产品，工业化的产品，个人用的产品，甚至有很多的消费品。都是跟显示连在一起的，所以对于 BOE 来讲，我们是要提供这个 IOT 时代的 intelligent interface 的 solution， 所以也就是我们要不断的变革。那么的例子都很多了，我就不不占用大家的时间，等会可以给大家。举几黑例子讲讲。Okay, the infamous Internet of Things. Mahu, what do you what do you think? Is that what is that going to bring to us? You know, what what does the Internet of Things mean? What does it mean for consumers? What does it mean for you? Right. So we, even though we've been hearing about it for a few years, it's only now that I, I, I'm really starting to see the benefit. And it, it first started as a huge collection of data. No. And that seemed good. You were taking data from everywhere.、Um, the problem is, it was too much data in a sense. How to make sense of this data was became the challenge. Now it helps supply chain management and helps companies become vertically integrated. So it's you know we say that data is the new pollution in a sense. When Internet of Things in the industry in factories themselves. Um, occurs, then there, the entire supply chain knows what the other you know, are speaking about. You you have a kind of collaboration that didn't exist before.、Uh, it's it's knowing that you're looking at the same thing as your supplier is looking at, or in a single case factory you're analyzing that same thing. So it's communication not amongst people always even. It's communication. Um, amongst results and data, and only the relevant data, this really changes even the way that people speak to each other.、Uh, there's no more blaming of a supplier, blaming you know, blaming their customer and their customer blaming their supplier. This sort of tension that has existed in business for years. Now it's a collaboration that leads to, I think, very fast iteration, and that can only be caused through a type of in industrial Internet of Things.、Mm -hmm. I can see that. I remember a few years ago in Silicon Valley seeing a very large company. You know, they were looking at their production lines in Asia real time, and if something、yeah. went wrong, they could see immediately what was going wrong. They saw the test results from their products going down there, and they say, "This is starting to fail on these criteria." And what are they, what are you guys doing about it? And this is more of that. That's what we're going to see. Yeah, and it's not, and it's not even for one part.、Mm. It's for an entire product. So, if you were looking at a mobile device, it's not just making sure that the semiconductor is, you know, is, is reproducible and、yeah. the process is good. It's how does that relate to the screen and how does that relate to the other、okay. chipset、okay. and the antenna.、Yeah. All, all of this is a part of the same vertical process, whether it's across supply chains and countries or whether it's in a single factory. Okay.、Yeah. Doesn't it also disrupt the、um, the disposability question? I, I mean, was going to come to if, that. If, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, but you carry it, on. Well, it fascinates me because、yeah. we're we're again talking about as if 
there's going to be this expansion, the continued expansion. Let, of, let's uh, move to it now. Then you brought it up. No, yeah, you, <laughs> you, you, let's let's move to it now. Um, well, I was talking to uh, some tradespeople the other day. It's my job. I yeah. talk to workers, and uh, and they were actually chuckling because their company hadn't thought about the fact that there's not enough of them. And so it takes two weeks to go fix somebody's dishwasher or whatever. But the internet of things, and when you get there, you still got, you pretty much got a laptop or a tablet and you fix it. it they're basically computer techs. They're not plumbers and mm. they have plumbing skills, but they're basically computer techs now. And they were talking about what it means for the fact that products won't break down as easily, or well, if they do, you just go to the, to the internet and it'll be fixed through the internet. So I think it personally, from a sustainability point of view, and uh, this end to endless consumerism, it's actually a very good thing, but it will change the nature of demand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, I, th I think so too. You, you, yeah, I mean, this is a wonderful thing that we notice that you have, if you look at an, old, uh, an older factory, you have, you know, we talk about people. Yes, there are a lot of, you know, people doing inspection. There's a lot of old legacy machines mm. that require a lot of manual labor. Um, labor is still needed, as you said, to make updates and changes, but it can be done from a distance. Um, it can be done so rapidly that you see the benefits of it immediately. So, it, it, and this, this happens through the, the B2B side. You know, you you're, have a supplier of, you know, of equipment that is you know, improving on a factory uh, piece of equipment that's making a consumer device. So it, this happens throughout mm -hmm. from the whole way from business to business to factory to factory and finally makes its way to a consumer. This seems enormously positive to us and we've seen this happening now yeah. quite yeah. a bit. Randy, would you like to come in on that? Sure. 刚才我在话题里讲了一个现在由消费领域的市场由B2C的市场现在C2M这个商业模式越来越普遍 Customer Namo 工业设计的人，很多的自动化的设备，所以这个都是相互相成的。我们不能把它割裂，这个强了，这个就弱了，这个强其实我们都是一个是互互动。Got you. Understand. Um, we we touched there where we started to get there towards sustainable um, production. Um, we mentioned possibly data pollution. What about real pollution? I mean, electronic goods surround us. We've got them everywhere. Um, what happens when they reach the end of life? Um, how do we recycle them? What do we do to them? Um, often they contain quite rare earth elements, quite expensive materials inside them. Um, so. You know, what, what, are we, what do you think we need to do with such a vast mountain of electronic goods that we've got? And how do we uh, make that, how do we recycle that stuff and make that production sustainable? And, and, um, uh, and, and instead of, you know, all my old laptops and cell phones going into a tip somewhere, I, I, I really don't know what happens to them. Matthew, can I start with you on that one? Well, these things seem unrelated when I talk about material science and I talk of, yeah. uh, about in, in communications through and but they're they're actually very closely tied the more that you start to manufacture on a scale which is very deliberate um, which we call the additive manufacturing which is almost atomically precise yeah the the more you're able to control what you're what you're building so updates to those things become something you can do remotely and it takes up less space. 
Now, there's waste in ways that we don't think of that are just as important as throwing away things and recycling them. Reducing the footprint of factories is important. Um, the, and this happens through being able to have computational solutions rather than just physical solutions. You have a great deal of energy uh, improvements from this. From the materials that you're creating, by having uh, information being gathered, you have more precision and less waste. Um, so improving yields, improving, you know, improving lack of waste, and reducing footprints of factories, all are environmentally sustainable things that we see this next industrial revolution creating. Indeed. I mean, some people talk of urban mining, you know, actually taking all this equipment and somehow shredding it and uh, extracting the near bin, another, I'm not going to try and pronounce them, but the, thing, the, the rare earth materials are really worth a lot of money, and particularly in semiconductor uh, terms, and, uh, and, and we may see some new businesses come there. John, what do, what do you think about recycling and sustainability of manufacturing in this electronics industry? Well, we're really committed to the circular economy, full stop, yeah. and uh, because if we if we don't actually embrace it, then our planet is on borrowed time. Planetary boundaries, climate change, we all talk about, but planetary boundaries are, you know, right here, right now, and it's uh, certainly not just carbon. So, if if you can't actually reuse it or recycle it, then and that will generate new business. And this is why we're a bit more optimistic about the jobs. Um, uh, future, because if you get all these things right, and we create, actually yeah. have the political will, and although it, there's much more in business, can I say, at, uh, at the multinational level than there is in many of our governments, but if you actually get that will right, and the partnership to actually uh, see the SDGs and climate action comes together in that kind of circular approach to manufacturing, then you know, the world will shift and we will see urban mining. I mean, I think it's a beautiful concept, really, that you would take your waste and actually try to actually extract whatever you can mm. from it. And um, so I think it is the future, but I think it's going to take brave young people to actually determine that that's the way they're going to build the future production rather than us clinging to the models we have today. But there could be corporate pressure to... And there is already, you even seeing it now embedded in computer-aided design systems and simulation systems to, for companies to take more responsibility for the life cycle of their product. Yeah. So yeah. in the design process, yeah. you're designing in what happens when this product reaches the end of its life. Is this possible to s dismantle this? Is it possible to recycle this? And maybe small changes in the early design stage and choice of materials can affect that latter bit because I think companies are seeing that they may have to meet standards to do this, so they're already beginning to cost this in. Um, Absolutely. You see that, do you, Matthew? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that it is this mentality change that's actually, you know, we talk about young entrepreneurs will have it, but it's, it's actually immediately relevant to large companies. Mm -hmm. uh, making more physical things and seeing reduction in yields and reduction in profits, you the more computation, the longer you can keep something going, the longer that you can reuse things for different purposes and more precisely use it, the high, better your yields are, yeah. the, more pro the higher your profits are. So there's a huge incentive for big companies that might be seeing a dip in profit margins. So I don't think that this is something that only young entrepreneurs are incentivized to do. We're seeing it with our very large customers. Yes. Well, that's good news. But we teach union leaders that they'll bargain for resource productivity. That'll be the new wealth. Yeah. For us, that's absolutely obvious. Whether you actually uh, work uh, through uh, planning um, uh, industrial transformation to reduce carbon or other greenhouse gases, or whether it's in fact uh, uh, elongating or recycling or reusing product. Because if you save on a carbon tax or if you actually save on the cost of production, then that's more wealth for workers to bargain for. So mm -hmm. for us, it's a win-win environment, but it's also just simply an imperative for all of us okay. who want to take responsibility. And, and I, I have been heartened. We've just finished a, a, a report with a group of uh, businesses called the, it, it's on the Business and Sustainable Development Commission. And they see both that they have to mainstream responsible business practice and that we need a new social contract to deal with the 
the fallout from yeah. the uh, the changes in in the model of production. So there's a lot of good will and good debate going on. It's just very slow. Yeah. Okay. I'm go- I'm going to ask Randy to come back on that, and then then I'll go for questions. So if anybody would like to think about any questions, I'll open up to that. Randy, when are you going to be able to make me a fully recyclable TV set or yeah. smartphone? <laughs> yeah. 回答这个问题，其实。中国有句很有名的古训：“少就是多 ，less is more。” OK， less is more。我们做任何产品一定要考虑它的可持续性发展。刚才讲的电视机的设计也是一样，那么包括所有电子产品的设计也是一样。我们这十几年、二十年来，我们看到很多。升级换代所产生的电子垃圾，其实这是一个全世界公用的问题。所以我们也一直在思考，电子产品，比如如何跟艺术有机的联系起来，我们的电子产品跟健康怎么联系起来？那么，我举一个简单的例子。我们现在正在做一个做一个产品。我们比如那些博物馆，很多那些世界名画艺术品，大家想看的话，一定要到博物馆去看，或者在网上看。Yeah. 但是我如果想把它摆摆做一个装饰品，怎么办？大家可能想到，可能我们要做一个仿真的画。挂在墙上，那么你想可以成千上万个这个画框，要消耗我们多少木材？那么我们就思考这个，我们有没有一个产品，跟全世界的博物馆联系起来，摆一个产品，里面可以显示成千上万的艺术品，我们可以在在墙上欣赏。那么我们也就一个电子产品，可以做成千上万的那些。Okay. 嗯、okay, so instead of having lots of objects of art around my house, <laughs> I would just have a big screen and I could say, "Tonight I want a Rubens up there <laughs> or whatever," and that would happen. Yes. Okay. Let, let's see. Do we have any questions, please?、Um, uh, anybody got a question for us for the panel? No, we're not going to come forward. I'm, well, I've got I plenty. I want to know when、yeah. when Randy's going to make me a smart watch that w- that looks like a bit of jewellery. Okay. That's my request, Randy. So if it's really customer to manufacturer, this is the challenge. But on a serious note, none of us have, apart from a reference from me, no one's actually talked about the risk to the business of cyber. Security、uh, problem. Please bring it up. No, no, I'm interested、mm, to know、mm. what these two think because,、okay. mm. you know, it worries us that in fact, you know, privacy is a thing of the past. Yeah. And that's、okay. pretty scary, and we're going to have to look at that from a regulatory point of view. But more importantly, in terms of a business uh, uh, piece, you know, we've all had cyber intrusions, I'm sure, and certainly as you get more and more dependent. On digitalisation, what does that mean for business? Particularly with the Internet of Things, because yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the data will be going into cloud from everything we own, drive, profitably wear. Yeah, Matthew, what do you what do you say? Well, I deal mainly with you know factory to factory or within、yeah. factories. So, but I mean, there, I'm not an expert on. Internet security, but there are two things. That data is secure, isn't it? I mean, factories don't want their data slipping out. Well, exactly. (laughs) So there are two. The two things that I notice. I think I think blockchain is getting more and more popular and more and more efficient. Um, And I also think that vertical integration in single factories is something that I think in the in the last fifty years had not happened. You'd had really diversification of supply chains across countries, across factories that were even close to each other. I think that. If you can sandbox everything in one factory, which is now possible because of, you know, it's not necessarily the Internet of Things, but the accumulation of relevant information from machines speaking to each other when creating a product, then you are eliminating it, even getting out,、um, and being insecure. 
Um, now, to, to the customer end, it is completely out of my expertise, although I do think blockchain applies as well. That encryption technologies will, will yeah. help with this. It will. If, 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 but there are governments and authorities that say, you've got to give us a trapdoor to this stuff. Mm. We've got, you know, you must give, some, some companies are refusing to do that, um, and, and some aren't. Uh, and that's the problem, isn't it? it is, you know, we, we're going to play into a regulatory regime here, with Zoom. Um, with, with well, and it, but it'll also be choices. At, mm. at what point do people withdraw? Yeah. because it becomes actually such a level of intrusion. So there's a business risk, but there's also the questions about human rights and, and privacy as well. Mm-hmm. Randy, would you like to come in on that one, on privacy and data? and and. <laughs> Yeah, 但是这个呢，是对你的健康进行管理一个电子产品。那么可能就跟我们普通建了一个电子手环，可能会有天壤之别。So instead of having a thing around your wrist, you you could have a small ring on your finger.可以血压、血脂、我脉跳、呼吸相关的东西，我们都可以在这个指环上检测出来。Okay. How do you protect the privacy of that data, though? Is that a software problem, or a personal problem, or a consumer problem, or? This is a. Okay, so that's a that's an issue to be determined, as yeah. they say. I'm going to get in one more question. Just we're, we're coming up against the time, but it's something that does fascinate me. Um, electronics has been the driver of enormous growth in the world economy. There's no doubt about that. Um, but we, you know, it's going to displace jobs. It's going to change jobs. But you're going to inc- have to encourage more young people into this industry as well. Um, and we're going to need a lot more. And I know there are some companies that have located their businesses to certain parts of the world and, and certain cities precisely because they're facing extreme shortages of electronic engineers and programmers and software experts and things like that. How do, we, how do you attract people, more people, into manufacturing and electronics manufacturing particularly? What do you, what do you think we need, you know, the industry needs to do to, to, to bring in, tr- attract and train people um, for, for this industry. Um, I'll start with Matthew and then Charlie. Okay. Well, I think that a lot of this is the, you, you see the proof when it happens and everybody gets excited to do it. We've seen this with government programs in the past. You build, you have the, in, in the United States, the Apollo program to go to the moon. People get excited behind things once they see that it's possible. Um, certainly governments can encourage things like this and make it possible to start new companies. Uh, but a big, a big part of this is just being able to do it. And it's not, there, I think there's a misconception about what the future of being able to build something is. I mean, we've talked about 3D printing or we've talked about using artificial intelligence. That doesn't require a PhD in either computer science or in applied physics. Yeah, um, <laughs> could do. The, well, those people are, no, I'm not saying those people aren't necessary, but. I, it's what I've done. <laughs> but uh, I think that, you know, we notice the skills of people who are good at gaming, for instance. Mm-hmm. You know, we're working in a world where we're dealing with 3D, we're dealing with rapid communication and uh, interaction. 
um, there, there are workers who, you know, are legacy workers that had been in factories working with their hands or in coal mines, that those jobs do not exist anymore. And the ability to train networks and to build new things for the first time in a long time is right next to you. So once you start to see what you're building as a possibility, it, it's exciting and it builds upon itself. So there may need to be some government stimulus to say, do this here, or venture uh, capital, uh, or, or you know, some type of funding. But the main thing is the excitement once you see the future starting to be built. And we're starting to see it for sure. And that's because the accessibility to manufacturing it, it, is with, with CAD CAM systems and virtualization systems and 3D printers. It's, ex ex it's exactly. much easier to actually say, I, I'm going to make something. Exactly. Because I can learn this. The software's cheap. The, the 3D systems are cheap. Right. And you, you see that as a way in to encourage people into Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Sharon, do you, what do you think about that? Well, we talk about it as a just transition. Yeah. It'll be a massive transition. We can already see the beginnings of it. And this is a concept that grew for us out of the climate change debate, that we didn't want to see standard, stranded communities and stranded workers. And so let's get the planning done now where you do look at attracting people you know, into industries. I totally agree with you. We've spent a long time in and around manufacturing and skills, and it has been the wealth, the innovative heart of, uh, of a lot of developments over, over decades, actually. But as uh, you said, from traditional products, this is going to be a whole new game. I worry most, to be honest, about uh, not attracting people in, but the gender divide, because it's still seen, frankly, as a boys' uh, game, when in fact women are very good at a whole range of the creativity yeah. some and of the, the Some of the companies I've spoken to, they say women make the best engineers, actually. Exactly. And yeah. so, yet, look mm. at the, you know, you, you can produce equal numbers of women engineers, but look at their earnings and look at the mm. big debate about sexual harassment in yeah. some country, companies we've just seen. So, so certainly, you know, the, the other thing that I think is a mentality that's wrong is while I understand why people would move to the places where those skills are, any company that thinks that you're going to get workers skill ready is actually not setting itself up for the <laughs> adaptability they need. I mean, we've been talking about lifelong learning for 30 years. Yeah. And yet we still are talking about lifelong learning. You know, the Japanese cracked it in the 70s and 80s with Kaizen. They were prepared to invest in skills redundancy. Unless we are prepared to actually, you know, find a way to bring the technology and workers with them. But I do think there's one, pos there's one really positive piece for the gender question, and that is the fusion concept. You know, if you're talking about, just take 3D printing, but if you're talking about um, integrating food as well as electronics and other things with 3D printers, although I draw the line at somebody told me they could print me now tandoori chicken and I said, no, thank you. But, you know, nevertheless, when you've got, again, the creativity and the raw materials yeah. mix in your head, that's less of a g gender divide in many ways. So let's hope. Let's hope. Let's hope. Randy, last word with you. Mm. 发展最新迅速的行业跟整个社会连接的模式一定要开放我们整体的资源可以互相沟通互用所以我们这个电子行业如何建立一个可持续发展的一个生态环境是非常重要的就是像我们爷爷建业业讲过了我们要建立一个一空一空 把所有的资源互相利用,高效的利用。所以这也是我们企业的责任。well, we've covered an awful lot of ground. We're right out of time. Um, firstly, translators, thank you very much indeed um, for, for getting back there to us. I'd like um, to thank very much the panel here. It's been a great uh, debate, I think. Matthew Putman and uh, Sharon Burrow. Thank and you Shane for Richard. the opportunity. Please, uh, go around. Thank you. Thank you.
and uh, we resume tomorrow um, at uh, the day third of the summit at uh, 10 o'clock in the main auditorium. Um, hope to see some of you there. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.